Well, two o'clock and the August 13th, 2024 public meeting of the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission will come to order. Uh, my name is Dr. William Puett. I'm the chair and uh, we have in the participants uh, window, the commissioners who are present as well as our executive director. So the uh, first item of business will be the um, after call to order is the introduction of myself. And I think I just handled that. <laughs> so I'm the new chairperson uh, since July and I'll only be here for another year, I suppose. But uh, so the next item of business is approval of the June 27th, 2024 minutes of the commission. And those were uh, posted, I believe is uh, online. And, uh, so the question, if everyone has access to those minutes, uh, it's their draft minutes until they're approved. And uh, are there any corrections to the June 27th minutes? And I'm a nice pregnant pause there while people get a chance to take a shot at this. It's never too late, by the way, to, you know, after they've been approved the first time, if you find something, you can always bring it to the attention at our next meeting. But since I hear no corrections, then the minutes uh, as circulated and as posted are approved. The next uh, item of business is the executive director's report. So I'm pleased at this time to recognize our executive director, Marcus Kawachi. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, what I'm gonna do now, uh, and for your benefit, Joanne, I'll explain a bit more than I normally do. Uh, I'm okay. going to share two reports that we present at our meetings. Okay. And I'll start with the caseload report because I think it'll make, uh, the, the second report will make more sense having gone over the first one first. So what we do in these meetings uh, from the, uh, you know, the day-to-day the -day staff side is to present a snapshot of our total caseload of, of discrimination cases that have been filed. Um, so the numbers of cases, the status of the cases, the age of the cases, the type of cases, uh, and, and, and various measures such as those. One thing that we can't do is go into detail about the specifics of cases because that's information protected uh, statutorily. And so un unless a case actually goes to docketing, you know, to, to go to hearing, we can't discuss the details of, of those cases. But we can discuss in aggregate uh, you know, uh, sort of basic information. So what I'll do first is to go, uh, as of yesterday, these are the numbers of cases in our total caseload. These are cases that have actually been filed. So this does not count pre-complaint submissions, but ones that have actually gone through the intake process and have been formally filed and served upon uh, the respondent, the person or entity accused of violating the law. And so we have here in our total case though, 365 discrimina discrimination cases that are open. And uh, you can see by the year in which these were filed, we have a few outliers here uh, that are quite old from 2017, uh, there's one, and then 2018, there are four and so on. Um, and so this makes up our, our total open caseload. So 365 cases as of yesterday, um, you can see the numbers, you can see the percentages. We like to see um, as low a percentage on the oldest cases as possible. And so um, these are not horrible numbers and we would like to actually see those oldest cases reduced and uh, disposed of in some way not disposed of, but, you know, gone through the process and uh, there'd be some sort of resolution or adjudication. Um, and so going further down, and if there's any questions from anyone, just please feel free to jump in. Um, 
I'm going to scroll further. So this goes over just changes from last report. The last report was in, on June 26th. And so you can see we have, uh, oh, I, this is, I, I got to change the date here, but um, 2024, the current year, um, we, ha we have 13, a net 13 additional cases uh, filed in 2024. And then going back in time, you can see these cases um, are reduced in number as they're investigated and as there is some resolution to these cases. Okay. And then probably, in my opinion, the most important category we have is the aging of the cases. So this gives you a snapshot again of how old or young our cases are. Um, and you can see that almost 30% of our cases are two years or older from the date of filing, which is quite a large number. And historically, we've had fluctuation, but at, at this point, we're, we're pretty high on the number uh, or the percentage of aged cases two years or older. That's something we really try to address, put resources toward and try to reduce as much as possible. And so that's something we work on. And I do report on this um, you know, every month. Um, so again, the lower amount uh, percentage wise we see of the age cases, that, 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 that's what we would like to see. So two years or older, and the next category would be 18 months to two years and so on and so forth. Um, and then going further there, down, oh, question, is, yes. Is there any, this is Joanne Adams, is there any uh, common theme as to why those cases that are two years or older are not resolved? Is there anything you know systematic or common that we could address? Um, well, as far as addressing them, I think we've tried to, address uh, issues with various strategies. But the reason why I think is um, each case is handled individually on their own merits. We do try to um, have them assigned and investigated roughly in the order in which they come in and are filed. However, each case has its own individual quirk. So the ones that are oldest, there's something a little unusual about those. There may be a problem in um, getting a proper response. There may be, you know, uh, parties that are not being cooperative or we have to go to court to uh, compel compliance. They could be just more complicated cases with large numbers of issues, large numbers of witnesses, uh, particularly thorny legal questions. So uh, all those are reasons why a case might be aged um, longer than we would like. Yeah. Um, Okay, so the breakdown by type of case, um, you know, we have certain types of cases. Uh, uh, so there are cases dealing with housing, so fair housing, and there are cases dealing with other types of issues, employment, public accommodations, access to state services. And so we do tend to break out the housing cases into its own category because we have a unit dedicated to housing. And here you can see um, numerically, again, by year of filing, the numbers of cases we have in our case load. Um, we have 96 open housing cases, which is a large number. It is an unusually large number of, of housing cases. And so I think part of it has to do with, we've really been trying to reduce the time it takes from a, an inquiry to come in into intake and then filing so I think we have <laughs> improved on the speed of intake, but what that means is we have a lot of cases that need to be investigated. And so um, that, that is something we are uh, tackling at the moment. Um, and if you go further down, these non-housing cases, and again, that would be employment, public accommodations, access to state services cases. These are the various stages in which those cases uh, find themselves. So we have, uh, response monitoring, which is where a case is filed. And then we need to get a response from the respondent in writing. And so that's a stage in which uh, we can't really move forward until we get a proper response. So that's one stage. Uh, we have some cases that go to mediation, which is an optional process. And my second report is actually specifically about mediation. We also have cases that um, have gone through the response monitoring stage. So we do have a 
a, a full and proper response. And those are waiting to be assigned to an investigator to complete the investigation. And then lastly, we have active investigation. So a case has been assigned to an investigator uh, and they are doing whatever it takes to gather evidence and come to determination. Um, and so you can see the numbers here. Um, we have a pretty large number in the response monitoring stage. And then from there, a uh, pretty sizable number. I didn't realize we had so many 53 cases in mediation. That, that's quite a few. Um, and then 35 pending assignment and then 33 actively being investigated by our, our investigators. Um, and then the last category here, it's, it's um, sometimes we have subpoena enforcement. So talking about for whatever reason, a party is not being cooperative and we need to actually subpoena either response or a witness or a piece of information. And so if it goes to the extent where we need to go to court to enforce the subpoena, that's something that we would report on to the commissioners. But uh, as of um, you know, this last period, we have, we have no subpoena enforcement issues going on. Okay. I'm going to move on. Oh, sure. I'm sorry, I'm so new, so I'll be asking no, a lot please. of questions that are probably obvious to everyone. Uh, do, do you have access to CAP for the arbitration? Is that a, an avenue that's open to you with your cases? Um, it's not something we use. We actually have, and I don't think we could use it because of the way that our, our cases are okay. confidential. But but um, when it comes to the mediation report, I will explain a bit more about what, what our internal process is, as well as an external okay. process. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, we do strongly believe in, in mediation, though. Okay. So moving forth, the second page is what we have as a fiscal year comparison. <clears throat> so we just completed our most recent fiscal year. Um, and, and the columns here represent all the case activity within a fiscal year going back to fiscal year 2014. Um, what we will do is, uh, like I said, our fiscal year, fiscal year just ended at the end of June, but we don't have an official set of statistics until we actually issue our annual report, which is required by, um, I believe by state law, but it's, it's, it's an annual report we put out. Once we have that column of statistics, we'll add it here, and then we'll be able to do some comparison um, from year to year. One thing I can point out right away is we've been keeping an eye on um, different things, but particularly if you look at this first uh, row, which is PCQ received, which is uh, PCQ stands for pre-complaint questionnaire. And that's the standard paperwork that people get either online on our website or they contact our office and we send to them. But that's the initial paperwork that sets up the whole process uh, if someone believes that they've been discriminated against. And so that's the key document we use to actually know what's happening and know that there are issues and to generate actual formal complaints. So um, what we've been tracking is how the pandemic over the past few years has affected uh, the operations of our office, and it has impacted the numbers of PCQs received. And so what I can point out here is if you, you know, there have been almost 700 or so, you know, six high 600s of PCQs received uh, for quite some time. And then when you hit 2018, 2019, it dips a bit, but really the real dip is from 2020, which is you know, start of the pandemic. And so going down to 519 in fiscal year, fiscal year 2020, 472 in 2021, and 496 in 2022. And what we've been seeing though is a real, a really uh, uh, observable uptick in the numbers of PCQs received as we've emerged from the pandemic. And so I think I can safely say that we are uh, essentially at pre-pandemic numbers in, in, in terms of the pre-complaint questionnaires received, which is a good sign because, um, you know, we do need some mechanism to know, uh, you know, when people are being discriminated against. And I think um, we're back to where we were pre-pandemic. Um, 
But anyway, this may be a bit much to absorb all at one time, Joanne, so you can take your time. And if you have questions now, we can address them. Or in, in the future, we can address whatever issues or questions you have. Um, and like I said, once we get the annual report out for this past fiscal year, we'll be adding that as the, as the most recent column. So I'm just gonna scroll down. This is this is something that really doesn't change from meeting to meeting, except when we do add a whole fiscal year. Um, but lastly, in this report, I'm going to address, I guess we'd call this our fiscal year to date comparison. And so um, going back the past five years, um, so we take whatever the date and time is, you know, and going back to the beginning of the fiscal year and compare that to the previous four years, just to have some sort of, you know, measuring, uh, you know, method here. Uh, and so I think, again, the PCQs received, we can see that uh, from last year and this year, we're, we're, we're at pretty good levels of PCQs received. Um, and this also uh, discusses intake decisions, which is when a case goes through intake, we determine whether or not there's uh, the right type of information to file a complaint. And so that decision tells us, you know, either we can file or we can't. And then the actual complaints, numbers of complaints files, filed, excuse me, uh, the number of investigations that have been concluded. And then um, if, if we have cases where there's enough evidence to show a violation in our opinion, in that case, we issue what's called a notice of cause and take the case to the next stage of our process, which is the uh, enforcement stage, which our staff attorneys would handle. So the notice of cause is indicated in this row, and then as well as uh, any closures that take place after there's been a notice of cause. So that could be a conciliation agreement. It could be going to a hearing and getting a, a result, or it could be some other type of, of resolution. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, we're very early within our current fiscal year. So I don't know how much meaningful uh, data comparison there is at this point, but I think, um, you know, we're off to a good start this year. Um, a good number of uh, investigations that have been concluded, uh, three notices of cause, which, which is good. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're early, but we're again off to a good start. Anything else, any questions before I move on to the next report? Um, before you move on to the next report, um, and uh, I ask uh, your pardon to begin with because Sorry. I mispronounced your last name. <laughs> Not <laughs> because, a problem. <laughs> so, okay, so it's, our executive director's last name is Kawatachi, not Kawatachi, Goldman, uh, so, <laughs> right. um, and then the other is that uh, it was my intention to introduce our uh, our new commissioner uh, oh. who just went through and completed the process of confirmation uh, by the Senate. That's my understanding. And so if, uh, uh, although the bios for the rest of the commissioners are on uh, the website, uh, since she is brand new and joining us, uh, uh, I would like to provide an opportunity for her to Tell us a little bit about herself and give us a quick oral um, rendition of her bio. So, Joanne, please. All right. Um, well, my name is Joanne Adams, and I started out and had a full career in information technology, which was way back when it was called data processing, and no one had a degree in it. And then um, after 20 years there, I was working here in Hawaii for the Department of the Attorney General as a data processing person. I was working on the um, juvenile justice information system as a systems analyst. And I decided that I needed to think as I was automating people out of jobs, I realized that maybe I better start thinking about a job that I would not get automated out of. And I think in part because I was immersed with attorneys I ended up going to law school. And that also um, the, another influence that happened is that the Clintons were elected and I remember that, oh, government can care about people. So I sort of went um, 
to law school with the intent of coming back and being more of an activist once I got out of law school. So when I returned from law school, um, I came back I, to Hawaii and I tracked down a fellow named Bill Woods. And those of you who are old, mm -hmm. old enough to remember Bill Woods will remember he was the preeminent activist slash gadfly of the GLBT, uh, and we called it GLBT then, not LGBT, uh, so the GLBT caucus. So um, I said, what are you up to? And he said, I'm about to form a caucus in the Democratic Party. So I jumped in and r really allowed him to mentor me for the next several years. And we ended up uh, over the, a total of 12 years, I was involved. He actually passed away during that 12 years. And so he was not able to see his final efforts come to fruition. Um, he felt strongly, and I soon came to believe that until we had marriage, the gay and lesbian community would not really have true equality. And so that was his ultimate goal. But we started out small. And so we got uh, sexual orientation and uh, gender identity, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> added to several uh, categories, including public accommodation, uh, housing, and I can't remember two others. There were four of them. So we got them added to that. And um, each time, of course, we met with resistance, <coughs> excuse me, because the legislature <coughs> viewed that whole area is, in 1998, we lost five legislators. So they were not very enthusiastic about us taking up the cause again. Yeah. But we kept at it. And anyone who's been involved politically knows that persistence is the key. And we kept at it and kept at it and kept at it. And eventually we got civil unions. And then shortly thereafter, uh, because of the movements nationally, there came down the national decision and we uh, encouraged the governor to call a special session and we had a special session on marriage. <clears throat> at that point, I then kind of uh, backed off my politi heavy political involvement because I was self-employed and I had to get back to resurrecting my law practice. And shortly thereafter, I got hired on by UH West Oahu to teach business law. So I'm now a part-time worker in three part-time jobs. Um, so I have a, a small law practice that does estate planning. I have a um, my UH West Oahu teaching online, which was a godsend during the pandemic because I just kept teaching during the pandemic. And then I have a small consulting practice where I'm working with a forensic psychologist here in, in Oahu. So that keeps me very, very busy. And uh, I got called by Connie who said, would you be interested? And I said, oh, wow, yeah, I really would. Because I'm, I'm a kind of at that age where I'd like to sit back and make a comment now and again and try and be helpful now and again. So I, I'm really hoping it'll be a great match. And since the first name I saw was Bill Pewitt and I remembered how much I enjoyed him, he was <laughs> our stellar uh, uh, parliamentarian. Uh, I really enjoyed, I look forward to joining all of you and I'm sure as more of you get, you know, I get to know more of you, I'll be even more excited about it. I've had several conversations with Connie and I'm already a fan. I think that, is that enough? I think that's plenty. Yes, I, very good. Thank you. Uh, thorough, I, except one thing I think I should point out is that for a little while there, at least before I retired in December, we we're uh, colleagues uh, yes. on the faculty of UH West Oahu. So it uh, just goes to show you what a wonderful resource you <laughs> yeah, but, yes, and that part of the UH. So, uh, well, again, uh, on behalf of the uh, commission and the other commissioners, I welcome you and thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you for your bio. So, uh, sorry, I didn't remember to do that earlier. But uh, that being uh, done, let's move along to the um, next item of business and we'll return the report uh, to our executive director, uh, Marcus Kawatachi. Thank you, William. And, and Joanna, we are so fortunate to have you. Thank you for that uh, bio of yours. And looking forward to uh, 
lots of good work ahead of us. So I'm going to move on to, let's see, how do I do that? Um, okay, here's our mediation report. Huh? It's a shorter report. Uh, but we are a big proponent of mediation. And one of the things that we like to do is to uh, report on the, the, both the, the internal and external segments of our mediation program. So in addition to uh, having an enforcement mechanism and investigative mechanism, we also have sort of a, an optional mediation uh, mechanism by which cases which are filed can potentially be resolved early in the process and to the satisfaction of both parties. And so for that reason, we're, we're very big proponents of mediation as a way to resolve uh, disputed issues and also to come up, well, come up with solutions that may not be possible just through our uh, enforcement mechanism. So what we have is um, we have a mediation coordinator who's a staff member and she, she both coordinates with external mediation programs. So these are typically community mediation centers and we refer cases out to them uh, for mediation. And we also have an internal process where our mediation coordinator uh, actually mediates cases. And typically those are our housing cases. And so again, ver very early in the fiscal year, um, but the update so far uh, from July 1st through yesterday We've had three of our cases uh, re referred into the mediation process, and we've had five cases, and these are, you know, ones from not not this period, but from from before, uh, which were concluded, um, and so three of them resulted in actual settlements. Two of them did not. Um, I won't say those are failures because even cases that do not result in the settlement often are prime for you know, resolution soon after, or, you know, can help to res help get the gears moving. So the parties are sort of thinking about solutions as opposed to getting entrenched in their positions. Um, and so we had three settlements, two non-settlements. The overall settlement rate of those would be 60%. If that holds for the rest of the fiscal year, I'd be happy with a 60% successful settlement rate. That, that's pretty good. Um, and so of those three cases that did settle, in mediation, um, we talk about the primary basis. So a, a complaint can have either one protected basis or more than one. And one of those we designate as being the primary. It's a bit of a, a fiction, but um, that's how we sort of categorize our, our cases. And so in terms of the primary basis for these three settlement uh, that settlements we saw, one was based primarily on arrest and court record. One was based primarily on uh, the complainant's race, and one was based on retaliation as a claim. And so the types of claims we had, one which was a dual file case, meaning it was filed with us, and also uh, there was jurisdiction to file either with the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or with HUD, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. So depending on if it's employment or housing, it could be dual filed with either EEOC or HUD. Um, and two of them were not, they were just state only claims. And again, of those three cases, one was an employment case, one was a housing case, and one was a public accommodations case. And you can see uh, both the external and internal um, mediation centers here. So uh, mediation of mediation center of the Pacific had one case which they successfully settled uh, as did Kuikahi Mediation Services in Hilo. And internally, we had three cases mediated and one resulted in the settlement. Uh, so there again, three out of five, 60%. Um, so that is a good start again to the early part of our fiscal year. Uh, but I do like to see that, you know, the mediations are of various cases and, you know, split up amongst the various mediation centers. So, um, you know, we, we do like to see, you know, wherever a case may be filed, uh, we encourage mediation, you know, in either internally or, or externally. 
Okay, so that's the report there. Any questions from anyone? Okay, I thank you for your sure. attention. Sure. Well, the next item then, uh, thank you, Executive Director Kawatachi. We uh, have a uh, on, a, on our agenda, the Chief Counsel's report. So Chair recognizes uh, Constant uh, Yonashiro and uh, for the Chief Counsel's report. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we do have a current case that has been docketed. Um, so Kawatachi, Marcus Kawatashi as executive director on behalf of the complaint filed by Junko Knipe uh, versus Gary Sumner as trustee and Peter Pritchard as trustee and Gary Sumner individually. Um, so just to kind of give an overview of um, the case for our new commissioner, this is a housing discrimination case um, based on disability, their sexual harassment and retaliation claims along with this case. It's currently... Um, in the process of the hearings and it has been assigned to Judge Leslie Hayashi. So she, uh, as hearings examiner, she will control the hearings um, and the discovery process. Uh, as a bit of background on your responsibilities as commissioners is after the hearings examiner conducts the hearings and takes all the evidence and hears the parties, then, um, then uh, the hearings examiner will issue a proposed findings of facts and conclusions of law and submit that to the commissioners. Either party can request uh, oral arguments in front of the commission. Um, and then at the end of that, then the commission looks at the record as a whole, considers the proposed findings of facts and conclusions of law and issues the final decision in order, which then is appealable to circuit court by either side. Um, so right now um, it's still in the hearings process. It's fairly early. I myself as chief counsel, normally I would be advising the commission, but for this particular case, I am recused because I was an enforcement attorney for about eight years and I just you know, started this position about a year ago. So I, I'm recused from this case, but a deputy AG has been assigned to advise the commission. Um, but at this time, there's no commission action needed, but if there is ever a time where commission action is needed, for instance, while the hearings examiner does control the hearing process, um, if the parties request an extension of time past 180 days to hold the hearing, the commission has to vote on it and approve that extension of time. So um, that hasn't happened in this case. It did happen in the previous case that we had. But at that time, you know, the deputy AG will advise the commission and, you know, guide the commissioners for any uh, reason for that. But usually it's pretty quiet up until the hearing has taken place and there's a proposed finding the fact and conclusions of law. So, uh, yeah, I think that's it for the docketed cases. Very good, thank you. And uh, is there any update? It looks like on B it says update of the hearing uh, amendments or uh, rules. Did you want to say anything about that? Um, sure, I, I can also give another overview because we do have a new commissioner. Um, I did, you know, talk to her briefly about what was going on, but I'll try to share my screen this time. Mm -hmm. So one update that um, I do have is that we sent, um, we did send these rules to the governor on July 22nd. So they're in his hands, they're just being reviewed. Um, the governor has to approve the rules uh, for a public hearing. So before we go to a public hearing, we have to get them approved by the governor. We believe that he's probably gonna sign off on it fairly quickly, mainly because last year we had basically the same rules with minor changes in between and he signed off on it. So we're right, you know, right before the finish line and then we went back to the drawing board because the AG had some questions. Um, the major change to our administrative rules is the definition of employment. So I'm sorry, I'm going to try and find it really fast. So previously, um, the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission's definition of employment for cases of independent contractor versus employee when our law would apply um, for employment um, was based on a 30-year-old case uh, for deck relief. In Rey Santiago. And in that case, there was about 12 factors that was very confusing to not only 
the public and you know defense attorneys, but also internally with our commission. Um, so the change that we have brings it into um, kind of congruence or is uh, nearly identical to the definition of employment for disability compensation. And um, I believe it's the prepaid health care act where you know they have to pay insurance employers have to pay insurance for their employees. So it breaks it down to only three three uh, requirements. The individual has been and will continue to be free from control or direction over the performance of the service, both under the individual's contract of hire and in fact, the service is either outside the usual course of business for which the service is performed or that service is performed outside all the places of business of the enterprise for which the service is performed. And the individual is customarily engaged in independently established trade, occupation, profession, or business in the same nature as that involved in the contract of service. So we feel like putting this definition in the uh, definition section of our administrative rules clarifies everything for you know employees, employers, and us. Um, and people don't have to refer to a 30 year old case that you know maybe people can't find because it's only on our website. <laughs> so, so we're hoping that clarifies things. Um, other things um, that we updated are, we try to be a little bit more gender neutral. You know, when these uh, rules were passed, it was over a decade ago. And so we're trying to update that. Um, we do have other definitions. The, the rule that the attorney general's office had issue with was the one on medical marijuana. And that's the only major change that we had from last year's previous version to this year's. Um, So, so we did put it in with, um, we try to make it as clear as possible that if someone uses medical medical cannabis, it could be a reasonable accommodation. Um, it doesn't mean that it will be, but it could be an option. And so by putting it into our rules, it clarifies also for employers that even if they have a drug-free policy under Hawaii state law, someone might be using it. Um, in compliance with state law. And so they have to consider what, during the interactive process, whether or not it's reasonable or an undue hardship. So we're hoping that that works. Um, and the AG's office thought this was good. So I have a good feeling that we aren't gonna get too much pushback on this um, mm -hmm. from the public. Oh, and as a side comment, we also, prior to going to the governor's office to you know ask for a public hearing, we did open it up for public comment. We didn't get that many comments on anything except for the definition of employment. Um, we also went in front of the Small Business Regulatory Review Board. Same thing, no comments really on anything except for um, the definition of employment. There was some um, questions about the definition of harassment, but if you look at our rules, we already have the definition of harassment in, in um, sexual harassment and ancestry harassment. So we're just making it clear that harassment can be on any basis. And we actually did have um, a contested case hearing that had an argument by a defense that I think it, it was religious harassment. And they're like, well, it's not prohibited because it's not in your rules. But we felt, you know, it's pretty clear you can't harass on any basis. But, you know, so these changes will make it very clear. Um, and then finally, uh, we do have um, changes to sex discrimination. Um, and primarily pregnancy, and also we want to be very clear that sex discrimination includes gender identity or expression and sexual orientation. Um, so the biggest um, prompt for us to update this was the, by the passage of the Federal Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, where if you look at how our rules are now, it limits it to reasonable accommodations for a pregnant female who has a disability because of pregnancy. So it has to reach a bigger threshold. You have to be female, number one, and then you also have to have a disability, not just a limitation. So it's a little bit higher threshold. So by amending this rule, it just says limitation, which is in line with the Federal um, Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. Um, so we, yeah. 
So I don't know. And if anyone has any comments or questions, please jump in. Um, and I do want to say, because we are trying to amend so many rules, and I think I talked about this at the last meeting, you know, that if we do want to do a little bit of tweaking later on, it might be okay if we, if everyone's fine with how the rules are now, you know, we can always come back and try to amend the rules at a, another time, but more targeted. So it, I think if it's more targeted, it would probably go through this whole process faster because people reviewing the rules don't have to go through 170 pages of the rules. Um, but this is, yeah, we want to make it clear that it doesn't apply only to um, individuals assigned female at birth. Um, and it is more expansive to include gender identity, expression, and sexual orientation. Very good. Thank you. Now, do any of the commissioners wish to uh, weigh in on that question? I, I, yes, I, when I read through it, I, I love the idea of decoupling pregnancy from sex. I mean, right now it is very much tied to female, but who knows where the technology will take us. And I think the point is we don't want discrimination if a person is with child. So I'm glad they're decoupling that. And I also love that Cindy mentioned uh, the individual sex assigned at birth. And I'm thinking maybe we should even, I would like to suggest that we would insert that assigned at birth to start getting through kind of shaking up that notion that whatever you were born with is what you are. The, your, your sex that's assigned at birth is in some cases as arbitrary as later on deciding that you don't like the assignment you received at birth. And I think whatever we can do to kind of indicate in that language um, more of an independence, because right now what you're born as for many people is truth. And what we're finding out is that's not necessarily true. So I'm sorry to wax on about that, but I do think it's something that piqued my interest and I was glad she mentioned the words assigned at birth, thank you. Very good. And so my 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 understanding of our uh, council's question was, uh, do we want to uh, wait and look at the possibility that there are some more things to tweak or do we want to go with this, get this, you know, clear, clear the boards and if that will not prevent us or, uh, you know, or the commission uh, or staff for recommending any uh, future changes. But I, um, so uh, my two cents is that we should not stop and wait for more possible things to tweak. We should get this out of the way uh, and then deal with things that maybe do need to be changed uh, at uh, subsequent uh, opportunities. So uh, I don't know how the rest of the commissioners feel about that as well. Um, I think that makes sense. We th This has already been a two-year process at this point. We don't want to start all over. I'll go with I that. Agree. Yeah. I agree. And even with the issues that I raised, I would certainly want to have discussions with the transgender community before I actually forward them to make sure that uh, I'm not inadvertently uh, with my suggestions of language offering something that they would not feel comfortable with. Very good. So then, uh, as far as I understand it, it is the uh, consensus of the commission to go forward with this and let's get this uh, these changes uh, completed and, uh, and through the uh, public approval process that we're gonna have to do, right? The next step is for us to hold public meetings uh, or for whatever input we might get from them, which you know could also point out different things for the future. But I really think we've you know, right after two years, let's get this over. <laughs> so, GSD. <laughs> I, it it sounds like we are all in agreement anyway. Yeah. But I think one thing I also I mean Connie did mention, but I want to reiterate is the fact that the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act has already passed, and our law is is sort of outdated at this point, I think is a good reason why we want to move forward and amend our pregnancy rules as soon as possible. So um, yeah, we're at your disposal and it, um, on your direction, I think we will continue to move forward on this. Great. Very good. 
So um, if uh, I see the next item is announcements and I jumped the gun on that one to introduce our new commissioner, <laughs> uh, Miss, if any. <laughs> So I guess, so uh, well, sorry, Joanne, no sorry, worries. I interject. I do want to clarify. Um, so Joanne actually has been appointed immediately, you know, by Governor uh, Josh right. Green, but she still has to go in front of the Senate for confirmation at the oh. next session because, you know, they're not in session yet. So that'll take place, yeah, in 2025. Okay. So. Okay. Very good. So yes, thanks for that clarification. Um, the uh, uh, process is process, my goodness. Okay, well, we do want to set our next commission meeting uh, and uh, I'm not sure what business is necessary, but I, uh, if I don't see anything in, an, you know, except for those rules and setting up the public hearings uh, that uh, we will need to deal with uh, in September unless, uh, uh, Unless I can stand corrected on that from our executive director or our, our council. Is there anything we'll need to deal with in September? If not, then we could look at October. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that the governor signs off um, hopefully soon. Um, but if he does, you know, I'll send around an email just for uh, scheduling purposes of when we can hold the public hearing. Commissioners, you know, if, if you don't want to attend, that's also fine. Um, it, we would have to have a quorum there anyways, and, you know, that's always difficult. So we can have just a representative, either myself or, you know, Dr. Peer or whoever wants to um, go to the public hearing and then just report back at the next one. So, um and attendance at the public hearing can be done um, remote? Yeah, remotely. So we're, we're primarily doing it remotely. We will have, you know, room in our conference room if anyone wants to show up. But, you know, we have to give at least 30 days notice prior to holding a public hearing. So even if the governor signs off today, <laughs> you know, which I doubt will happen, it will be September 13th by the earliest. Well, not even because we have to, you know, publish it in newspapers. So probably end of September. So um, I don't know if that changes things for scheduling the next meeting. Well, um, if we try to schedule a next meeting, let's say at the end of September, uh, this could uh, uh, need to be changed anyway. So maybe we should just wait until you have more information for us and you can send around a request uh, for uh, you know, scheduling uh, based on what we get out of the governor's office. So instead of setting, what I'm sort of suggesting is instead of instead of setting a, a meeting date, say at the end of September or the beginning of October, maybe we should just wait to see what happens and then we will await uh, your survey of the commissioners uh, to establish when the uh, the meetings, when those hearings should take place. Because those hearings, they, they are considered, uh, if I understand it, the same as a commissioner's meeting. We have to have quorum. Yes. Right. Etc. Cetera. Okay. So that being the case, I don't see the need to set a particular date at this time period, but we should be on alert as commissioners for the possibility that we will need to do this sometime either at the end of September uh, or beginning of October. Yeah. I'm fine with that, Connie. Sound good? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, that being the case, and we have concluded our agenda, and since there is no further business in order, uh, this oh, meeting... One question. Oh, Do we yeah. always meet on the same day of the week since we're leaving it loose so that I can block out those days or not? Well, that's a good question, and uh, we tend to do that in uh, as, a, as a past practice. <laughs> so is there any objection to... Uh, trying to block out uh, everyone's uh, Tuesday afternoon at two o'clock. Uh, we had problems with a previous commissioner who, because of uh, uh, work at the DOE, uh, there was a lot of need to uh, you know, move things around. But that since that doesn't appear to be the case now, unless someone speaks up or, <laughs> um, I, I don't see any problem with holding on to Tuesday at two. is our potential date. So then all of us can be thinking of uh, 
whatever you do, hold on to Tuesday at two at the end of September, beginning of October. Uh, and then maybe that'll also assist Connie if she's uh, trying to work with the governor's office to set the uh, hearings. Okay, that sounds good. Wonderful, okay. All right then, since again, no further business is in order, um, this meeting is adjourned. It's at 2.49 or 2.50, excuse me, by my, uh, by my clock. And I wanna thank all of you for being here and uh, uh, a real delight to meet our, our new commissioner. <laughs> thank you very much. Nice to meet all of you. <laughs>